Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode. I'm Arshad Kanani with uh, CRI Associates. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to have my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ramin Tadioni, Professor of Ophthalmology uh, in Paris, France, to be here with us uh, to discuss the latest data uh, in ret vitreoretinal retinal care and studies presented at clinical trials at the summit 2023. Welcome, Ramin. Thank you, and hello, Arsha. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Ramin, for joining us. You know, in this uh, podcast, we before we dive into the topic at hand, we actually get to know our faculty a little bit. So I have a few questions for you to start the conversation here. Everybody knows Ramin Tadioni, the president of Uretna, an international KOL, but there's many things people don't know about Ramin Tadioni. So first one is, how did you end up in Retina? Oh, that's a good question, Arshad. So I chose ophthalmology first because I wanted to have the medical and surgical aspects. And then retina, because once I was in ophthalmology, it seems to me that that's the most sci scientific subspecialty in which they, there was a high potential for progress. So that's the way I ended up in retina. Great. And how did you end up in ophthalmology? So um, I was doing general surgery first, so that was the beginning, and uh, I just noticed that people were not so happy, but in the OR, right beside me, there were ophthalmologists, and all of them seems very, very happy, so I say, that's a good sign. Yeah, that's that's a great, I noticed that too, obviously, everybody noticed that pretty quickly, you know, I wanted to do cardiothoracic surgery, and I rotated as a student, and I realized that that's not me. I want to be happy more than more days in my life than unhappy. That's a very good point. Uh, tell us about your hobby. You know, you travel a lot, you speak, you run you retina as a president, uh, you have all these other things, you take care of patients, head of department, but what do you do outside uh, your your work? So my favorite sport is rowing. And honestly, rowing with friends early in the morning, close by Paris, when it's just waking up, it's just magic. So that's that's uh, some oxygen in, in the weekend. Oh, wow. So you actually go, you're not rowing just with an artificial machine. You're actually going into outdoors and, and doing the real rowing. Okay, that's that sounds, I mean, Paris is so beautiful, right? And, and it's, I can only imagine and then uh, how beautiful it is to row in the morning. Very interesting. What about, I mean, you live at, in one of the best spot in the world, right? You live in Paris. Everybody wants to go to Paris to visit. So what is your favorite vacation spot? Um, the French Polynesian islands are one of the last preserved paradise on earth. But I should also confess that I often come on a holiday with family in the U.S. And you have such a diverse, rich, natural beauty and also art and architecture in your country. So it's a very good place to come for a holiday too. Great. Yeah, there, there's a lot of amazing places in the world. And and I know recently you were in the U.S., right? Last month with your family. What did you do? So we visited a few cities, New York, then Chicago. And then we end up in Florida and then in Bahamas for a few days. It was really great. That is That sounds like an amazing vacation. Okay, so Ramin, uh, let's get to the topic at hand. You attended uh, clinical trials at the summit 2023 live this year. You flew all the way uh, from Paris for a one day meeting and you are part of the program uh, committee of clinical trials at the summit. Tell us, you know, attending, you you participated virtually last two years, but this time you were live. Tell us, what do you think about the meeting and and how much uh, you know, what are your thoughts on the agenda and interactions that we had at CTS this year? I really enjoyed. Thank you for organizing it. I would say that being uh, in person was even much better than being virtually because the interaction in between discussion and meeting people and it's a day full of discussion on innovation. What's new? What could be improved? And I, I find it so uh, energizing, so interesting. So usually after a short trip like this, it was a quite long trip, you feel tired. But this time when I come back to the department, right by after uh, coming to Paris, I was just full of energy. So I, I loved it. I will come again. You will you will be invited every year, as you know, you're part of the meeting and the program committee. So we'll love to have you back. And, and Ramin, I really enjoyed your talk, right? Your talk 
was about the waste in diabetic retinopathy trial. And it was a it was a talk that's outside the box. And I don't think you can give that kind of talk at any other meeting. This is like open meeting, no CME credits, robust discussions, as I said. So I really, I really enjoyed your talk, by the way. So we hopefully you give another uh, Cavalier talk next year <laughs> at CTS. So, you know, today we'll be discussing about two or three different programs and some of the data that was presented. You know, you have been a leader in the innovation in the space of DR, diabetic macular edema, and, and you have always pushed the field to have non-invasive options uh, for for the for patients with diabetic macular edema, you know, I presented the data from the stage one of the Diamond uh, Phase three study with OCSO1, which is a dexamethasone eye drop that can penetrate to the back of the eye, and 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 obviously some of the early work and the continuous work you do um, on the program. Can you tell us why this drug is unique and why are you excited about the results from the stage one of the diamond study? Yes, of course. You you wonderfully presented the, the result at the CTS and it was very clear. So I think this is a very interesting technology per se because how you can, instead of injecting the drug in the eye, have a high concentration of the drug inside the eye. And as you presented, there was three drops a day. Patients have a gain of more than 15 letters in six weeks in 25% of patients. The average was seven letters. So the results very similar to what we expect in injection, but just by atros. And this is not a really a competitor to injection at all. I think because it's non-invasive, as you say, it opened new ways of treatment and new possibilities, in particular to treat early. Because until now, we always have this balance of risk and uh, benefit. And here, because it's non-invasive, you can treat very early and preserve the vision. So there's a chance to have patients with 20-20 vision because you treat them earlier. And maybe if you treat very early, you can have a shorter treatment too. So I think this opens many possibilities, including this one. Yeah, no, I'm excellent summary. And I mean, like the holy grail is to have an, a non-invasive option for DME patients. They're working, they don't like injection, there's cost of care, there's missed work. And having an eye drop that can actually impact the disease. You know, I personally had many patients in that trial, and I'll tell you, I was impressed with two things. Number one was how fast it started to work. Even though I was masked, I could tell, you know, you usually don't get these improvements in, in, in CSC that fast in, um, you know, patients who are getting the placebo drop. Of course, patients were either giving OCS or, or placebo eye drops. And the other one was the correlation in 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 structure and function, meaning that patients who actually gain vision also had improvement in anatomy. It's not like just vision signal that sometimes people say that this is not real. You actually saw CST improvements and, and we saw um, vision improvements. So, so very, very exciting um, platform. So Ramin, you said this is not competing with uh, with intravitreal injection. Can you can you explain a little bit to our audience what you mean by that? So my point was that we have indication for intravitreal injection. Of course, in some of them we can also use this, but there are indication in which we are not going to do injection in any case. It's uh, patients who have a twenty twenty vision and some edema. You may not go to injection at this patient, but with the eye drop option you may propose the eye drop because this is again non-invasive and give the possibility. So I, I think that's the, uh, the interest that is quite unique is that you have possibilities to do things that you cannot do with the injection. And also maybe in patients are, after injection, they are doing well to avoid the recurrences. We may put one drop per day for a long term. We don't know. So it opens the imagination to new possibilities, new way of treatment. So that that's very exciting, I think, and it's uh, it can help uh, patient beyond those who are already treated uh, with injection. No, I think that's very clear that you know, in addition, early intervention, maintenance phase. You know, the one thing, obviously, you know, especially in the U.S., you know, there's a lot more uptake of steroids outside U.S. and the U.S. physicians are concerned about the IOP spike and the cataract formation obviously in the younger fake patients with DME. This is obviously 12 weeks results, but 
what I saw was, you know, safety profile that looks better than intravitreal uh, steroids, at least at this stage um, of this program. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you're absolutely right. So first, the problem with intravitreal injection of steroids was that once they are in, they are in. So you have to have them for months. So if you have an increase of pressure, you cannot get rid of them easily. Here, if a patient have an increase of pressure, you can just stop it and the pressure will go down. And as you said, interestingly, the rate of uh, increase of pressure was low here. And the other possibility would be also not to do a continuous treatment. Maybe they don't need. And as you said, at six weeks, most of them seems to be dry. So you may stop. And then the pressure, they, because we know that the pressure depends on the continuous uh, treatment. So if you make some windows, it may not be the same. Same for cataract. So I think there is some signal, as you said, that safety may be different. And that, that's also a very positive point for, for this eye drug. No, I think I think very exciting. So, you know, we'll see the 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 pivotals are gonna start in the near future and we'll see if we can have a non-invasive option for our patients, especially like there's no other program this late in the stage for it. So uh looking forward to be participating in that trial and of course to the data. Let's move on to another aspect that came in in the late breaker session that you moderated, Ramin was the TKIs and, you know, tyrosine kinase inhibitors are pan-VEGF blockers, they're intracellular, and they block, uh, you know, pan-VEGF intracellularly, multiple programs, uh, you know, ocular, OTX TKI, uh, you have EVIP, and you have uh, CLS-AX. Looking at tyrosine kinase inhibitors as sustained delivery platform. So, Number one, um, looking at the 12 months uh, data from OTX TKI, what are your first thoughts? And then how do you overall see the TKIs as a treatment option for patients with a neovascular AMD? We have the data and of course, possibly for DR, which we'll address second. That's also, it was a very interesting presentation. Of course, it's contrary to OCS that we talked that which is on phase three here, it's a smaller number of patients. We are still early in development. But it's very, very promising because as you said here, you inject something that is slowly degradable for a long time. You will have the drug. And in the patients that mainly were previously treated, it was a clear difference in this patient that were presented before and after the injection. And before uh, the injection, they have other uh, anti-VGF injection. And after this implant in the eye, they, they needed much less injections than previously. So that really shows for maintenance first that you have a possibility to decrease the number of injections with this implant. And this is also very promising for probably all the patients that always prefer to have less, less injections. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's the whole goal, right? We know the real world data from the work you have done um, with Frank and others on you know, the, the unmet need of having durable option in patients in different countries like your aura study showed that had poor outcomes compared to trials because of treatment burden. So I think TKIs are good maintenance phase drugs. You know, the idea would be to acutely control the disease. Now, we don't know if naive patients can respond. You know, the OTX Australia study, the phase one had some naive patients and we did see a response. So, you know, as a field, we are learning and evolving. And I think we're going to see multiple programs going into the pivotal stage in the near future. And then we'll see where TKIs fit in. But one important thing is that these are in-clinic injections. So it's not going to the OR. That is a differentiator. And then the safety profile so far has been, you know, no new signals. Of course, as you said, this is early. We don't have uh, long uh, term data. We don't have large number of patients, but it appears that it's a simple injection. So, so the next topic, uh, Ramin, you love DR. It's a very controversial topic. When you know you your presentation at CTS saying that we do all this investment in in DR trying to avoid these patients to get to DME while we have good treatment for DME and PDR and it may not make a difference if we treat them early versus late and the field is struggling and you are right because we have intravitreal aflibercept and ranibizumab approved for DR um, in the U.S. 
and and nobody or very few of us use it in NPDR stage. We do use it when we get to PDR. So uh, a question for you is what about a pill? So if you had a pill, uh, like uh, the data presented uh, for APX3330, you know, this is an oral pill and, and, the, and the results from the Zeta study were, were presented at, um, at CTS. What are your thoughts about having a pill for DR that can stop worsening? Does your opinion change uh, compared to, you know, your opinion with intravitreal injections? Uh, absolutely. So uh, I think if a pill could avoid worsening of DR, that's real uh, progress because diabetic patients, unfortunately, they have a lot of pill to take. So if you can add one and it guarantee or decrease the risk of uh, loss of vision, it really makes sense. And here they don't have to see the doctor often. And the problem is different. I, I think um, there have been some confusion about. Uh, making disappearing the sign of DR and improving DR. But here, what we are talking is really that it's not going to worsen. The ME will not appear or the PDR will not appear. That's a very different endpoint that just counting the hemorrhage and say hemorrhage disappears, everything is good. But here we are really talking about complication. And if a peel is able to decrease the eye complication of diabetes, that would be fantastic. And of course, we need this peel to have no side effects or very few side effects, but if it's the case, it's a game changer. Great. No, I I think that's a really good point, right? For the audience that you come in saying that it's not worth treating DR because there's a big burden to the patient. There's risk of injections. There is disappearing of DR hemorrhages, but then it comes right back when you stop the injection while you're not saying that we don't need to treat DR, it's just the risk benefit profile and the outcomes may not be different with the, the, the risk of invasive therapy like intravitreal injection. But, but for an oral pill, we have multiple programs looking at oral pills and, you know, APX3330, uh, you know, in the Zeta-1 study, what, what we saw was that it prevented the worsening, um, uh, you know, in diabetic retinopathy, you know, patients treated with, APX 0% at three step or greater worsening from baseline compared to 16% for placebo after 24 weeks of treatment. So you're right. I think giving another pill for a patient with DR and they stay where they are, I think would be very meaningful. In the Zeta 1 study, you know, the, the safety and tolerability was good. But of course, in a larger study, we'll be looking at, you know, if there is any adverse events related to the pill, because as you said, we don't want to become internal medicine doctors. And, and so we need to make sure that the pill is very safe where we don't have to monitor LFTs and other things. And it appears that APX um, is a pill that doesn't have too many side effects. So, you know, they have end of phase two meeting with FDA later this year, and then we'll see if we can have this in pivotal trials, looking at three-step worsening. The other benefit of the pill, Ramin, obviously is that you can have bilateral effect, right? So you can have improvement in both eyes and that's very beneficial to the patient. So it feels like you will be prescribing a PO drug for DR, but you will not do intravitreal injection. Is that correct? That, that's correct. I think they will not wait for me. Probably the diabetologist will already prescribe it and the patient will not see me. And that will be the best result if they don't need me. That's a very good sign for them. Yeah, that, that's a really good point that we can address the disease early so they don't have uh, outcomes that you you don't need to unleash the super surgeon Ramin there to fix the TRD. We can hopefully not get there. I think that's that's a really Really good point. Okay, Ramin, great conversation. And, and to wrap up um, uh, this podcast, again, some questions about yourself. Tell me what, what career achievement you are proud of. You have achieved a lot in your career and you're still young in your career. You have, you are the head of department. You are president of U-Retina. You have published hundreds and hundreds of articles. You have contributed to all these new drugs, uh, being a member of steering committee, but what is one achievement you are very proud of? Very proud of having the chance to help patients with what I learned from my teachers. Very proud of my fellows who are now being known and important people, and I'm very happy to see them going up and up. 
And I'm, uh, of course, grateful to have the opportunity to lead several research projects like AVRED, our national AR program on DR, and now uh, the National French Institute of Myopia that we will open uh, in March 2024. 20, uh, so uh, in a very near future, and I think that will also help many myopic patients that struggle with complex complications. So I think if I, everything happens good, um, I'm very so proud of all these people that helped me to do this. Great. You're always so humble. You know, you you are, you always credit others, but you know that you are super smart and you are super nice. And And one thing, you know, obviously I know is that Every time um, I see you, you have a smile on your face and you're always very kind and humble. So that's something I really like about you. And I think that's why people want to work with you because it's you're so pleasant and, and, and it's such a pleasure to work with you. And then the last question is, obviously, you kind of went into that already, that you are training all these new generation of physicians and you're very proud of, of them. How do you want to be remembered when you retire? Do they want to say that, uh, you know, Dr. Tadioni was uh, was the nicest guy? Is that how you want to be remembered? You want to be remembered as a good dad? You want to be remembered as a great doctor by your patients? So what is, how do you want to be remembered when you retire? And of course, this is way, way, way in the future. Oh my gosh. I, oh, everything you said, I would love. As today we talked about innovation, I would say I would love if I am remembered to be remembered as someone who embraced the changes and try to build a legacy that would outlive me and help others beyond what I can do as an individual. Uh, others will do much better than I do. No, you're, you're always so kind, but I think you're right. The impact you're making um, globally is huge. I think that's why we do what we do in terms of clinical research and new programs. And, you know, I didn't know about this myopia initiative that you are putting in, you know, this is great for patients uh, in France and and maybe other countries will copy that so that we can have best outcomes uh, for myopia. So thank you, Ramin, um, for excellent discussion. Thank you for being here. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks for always being an advocate for patients and always driving um, the field forward. Thank you, Arshad. You contribute so much for innovation, for helping patients, for helping colleagues. You are fantastic. And thank you very much for having me with you. Thank you, Ramin. It's a pleasure to always work with you. I also want to thank the audience for listening to this podcast. Thank you.